Welcome to Jeremy's IT Lab. This is a free, complete course for the CCNA. If you like these videos, please subscribe to follow along with the series. Also, please like and leave a comment and share the video to help spread this free series of videos. Thanks for your help. In this video, we will talk about port security. Port security is a security feature on Cisco switches that allows you to control what source MAC addresses are allowed on a switch port as well as how many MAC addresses are allowed on a switch port. It's covered in exam topic 5.7, which says you must be able to configure layer two security features, including DHCP snooping, ARP inspection, and port security. Those other two, DHCP snooping and ARP inspection, will be covered in the next few videos. But for this video, we'll focus on port security. Here's what we'll cover in this video. First, I'll introduce what port security is. But knowing what it is isn't enough. I'll also explain why we use port security, what security benefits it offers. And I'll show you various port security configuration commands too. As always, watch until the end of the video for an awesome bonus question from Boson Software's XSIM for CCNA, my recommended practice exams for the CCNA. First up, what is port security? Well, it's a security feature of Cisco switches. It allows you to control which source MAC address or addresses are allowed to enter a switch port. So it's configured on a per interface basis. By the way, throughout this video, I'll probably be using both terms, port and interface, but I mean the same thing. So if a frame with an unauthorized source MAC address enters a port, an action will be taken. There are a few possible actions that you can configure but the default action is to place the interface in an error-disabled state. In effect, this is like shutting down the interface. Traffic will no longer be sent or received by that interface. Let me demonstrate. PC1 is connected to Switch 1's G01 interface. PC1's MAC address is a.a.a. .a .a. As you know, MAC addresses are actually 12 hexadecimal characters, but I'll shorten them here to make it easier to read. The user of PC1 brought in his personal laptop to work, that's PC2, and it has a MAC address of b.b.b. The network admin has configured port security on Switch 1's G01 interface, so it will only allow frames with a source MAC address of a.a.a .a .a to enter the G01 interface. When PC1 sends a frame, Switch 1 will check the source MAC address and see that it is a.a.a. .a .a so it will forward it to the destination as normal. But the user unplugs the cable from PC1 and then connects it to the laptop, PC2. What will happen when PC2 sends a frame? Well, Switch1 will check the source MAC address and notice that it is b.b.b, but only a.a.a .a .a should be allowed. So Switch1 will place G01 in an air disabled state. It won't send or receive data until you enable the interface again. Now, as I said, there are a few possible actions that can be taken, and I'll explain the others later, but for now, let's assume the default action of shutdown. So, noticing that his laptop isn't able to communicate over the network, the user unplugs the cable from his laptop and connects it back to PC1. What happens when PC1 sends a frame? Well, the interface is still air disabled, so PC1 is also unable to communicate over the network. There are two ways to enable an interface that has been disabled by port security, but I'll cover those later. Okay, let's cover a few more points about port security. When you enable port security on an interface with the default settings, one MAC address is allowed. You can configure the allowed MAC address manually if you want, but if you don't configure it manually, the switch will allow the first source MAC address that enters the interface. That MAC address will be allowed on the interface, but all others will be unauthorized. However, you can change the maximum number of MAC addresses allowed. Here's one situation in which you should increase the number of MAC addresses allowed on the port. Phone 1 is directly connected to Switch 1, and PC1 is connected to Phone 1. The default port security setting, which allows one MAC address, isn't going to work in this situation, because both PC1 and Phone 1 are going to send traffic using their own MAC address as the source, so that's two MAC addresses. So, in this case, let's say we configured Switch 1's G01 interface to allow two MAC addresses. 
but we didn't configure them manually. We will let switch1 dynamically learn which two MAC addresses to allow. So if phone1 sends a frame, switch1 will add it to the list of allowed MAC addresses and forward it as normal. Then if PC1 sends a frame, switch1 will also add that one to the list and it will be forwarded. But now Switch1's G01 interface has reached its maximum number of allowed MAC addresses, since we configured it as two. If the interface is connected to another device and it sends a frame, Switch1 will shut down the interface because the source MAC address isn't authorized. Okay, in this slide I introduced two main points. First, the default number of allowed MAC addresses is one when you enable port security, but you can configure it to allow more. Second, the allowed MAC addresses can be manually configured or dynamically learned. In this example, both were dynamically learned. But for example, we could have manually configured switch1 to allow c.c.c on G01, and then allow it to dynamically learn a.a.a when PC1 sends a frame. So if more than one MAC address is allowed, they don't all have to be manually configured or all have to be dynamically learned. A combination is possible. You can probably imagine how port security could be useful, but let me briefly explain. It's useful because it allows network admins to control which devices are allowed to access the network. Someone can't just plug an unauthorized device into a switch port and gain access to the network. However, MAC address spoofing is a simple task. It's easy to configure a device to send frames with a different source MAC address. So be aware that port security isn't a perfect solution in this regard. But rather than manually specifying the MAC addresses allowed on each port, port security's ability to limit the number of MAC addresses allowed on an interface is often more useful. For example, think back to the DHCP starvation attack carried out in the Day48 lab video. The attacker spoofed thousands of fake MAC addresses, and the DHCP server assigned IP addresses to those fake MAC addresses, exhausting the DHCP pool. But not just that. Switches can't learn an infinite number of MAC addresses, so the switch's MAC address table can also become full due to such an attack. Then, the switch can no longer learn new MAC addresses, and it will flood every packet it receives. Using port security to limit the number of MAC addresses allowed on an interface can protect against such attacks. Both aspects of port security are useful, controlling which MAC addresses are allowed and controlling how many MAC addresses are allowed. So we'll continue to look at both aspects. Let's move on. Now, before going deeper into other areas of port security, let's cover the most basic configurations. Port security is enabled directly on the interface. So I enter interface configuration mode for G01 and try the command switch port port security. However, it's rejected with a message saying that gigabit ethernet 01 is a dynamic port. What does that mean? To check, I used show interfaces G01 switch port, and here's the answer. By default, switch ports have an administrative mode of dynamic auto. That's the DTP command, switch port mode dynamic auto. I covered that earlier in the course. Port security can be enabled on access ports or trunk ports, but they must be statically configured as access or trunk. Dynamic auto and dynamic desirable are not allowed. So I used switch port mode access to configure it as a static access port. Then I used show interfaces G01 switch port again to check. And the administrative mode is now static access. So the switch port port security command should work. And indeed it does. So port security is now enabled on G01. When you use just this command, port security is enabled with the default settings. Let's check out those default settings. The command show port security interface followed by the interface name is very useful. Let's see what it shows. First, port security is enabled and the port status is secure up. Secure up just means port security is enabled and the interface is up. The default violation mode is shut down, as I said before. If an unauthorized frame enters the interface, it will be air disabled. Here are some default settings regarding the timers. The aging time of zero minutes means that the addresses will never age out. There is no timer, but I'll explain these later. Here we can see information about the MAC addresses. The maximum is one, currently it knows zero, 
zero have been manually configured, and there are zero sticky MAC addresses. That's also something I'll mention later. Switch1 hasn't received any traffic on this interface yet, so the last source address is all zeros, with VLAN number zero. Finally, there have been no violations, so this counter here is at zero. Now I sent a ping from PC1 to R1. Let's see what happens to the output of this command. I've highlighted the two places that have changed. Total MAC addresses has changed from 0 to 1, because Switch1 learned PC1's MAC address. Note that the maximum is also 1, so Switch1 won't be able to learn any more MAC addresses on the interface. Also, the last source address has changed to PC1's MAC address, and the VLAN is 1, the default VLAN. Now let's bring back PC2 and connect the cable to it instead. What will happen when PC2 tries to ping R1? Here's what happens. From the top of the output, the port status has changed from secure up to secure shutdown. By the way, if you check show interfaces status, you will see the status air disabled that I mentioned earlier. But in the show port security interface command, it says secure shutdown. Also, the total MAC addresses count has reset to zero. So it dynamically learned PC1's MAC address as a secure MAC address. But after the port was shut down, it was cleared. The last source address is PC2's MAC address, b.b.b. And the security violation count is now one. Okay, so let's see how to re-enable an interface that has been disabled by port security. Okay, here's how to manually re-enable the interface. But before entering any commands, you should first disconnect the unauthorized device. After disconnecting the unauthorized device, you should then enter the commands on the interface. Shutdown, which puts it in an administratively disabled mode, and then the no shutdown command to re-enable it. Let's check out show port security interface. The port status is back to secure up. The last source address, which was PC2's MAC address before, has been erased. And at the bottom, the security violation count actually was reset too when the interface came back up. So with the default violation mode shut down, this security violation count shouldn't go higher than one. Now, there's another way to re-enable an air disabled interface, that is air disable recovery. It causes air disabled interfaces to be automatically re-enabled after a certain period of time. There are actually various reasons an interface can enter an air disabled state. I use the command show air disable recovery, which lists all of them. There are so many that I had to omit a lot of them. The output doesn't fit on one screen. On the left is each air disable reason, and on the right it will show whether or not air disable recovery is enabled. By default, it is disabled for all reasons, so air disabled interfaces will not be automatically recovered. The one we're looking for is p-secure violation. That means port security violation. Notice the default timer is 300 seconds. So every five minutes by default, all air disabled interfaces will be re-enabled, but only if air disable recovery has been enabled for the cause of the interface's disablement. So let's enable it for port security violations. Here's how to enable it. The command is air disable recovery cause followed by the cause, which is p secure violation in this case. And just to demonstrate the command, I shortened the timer with air disable recovery interval and then specified 180 seconds. Here's show air disable recovery again. Notice that the p secure violation recovery timer is now enabled, and the timer interval is 180 seconds as configured. And just to demonstrate, I caused G01 to become air disabled again. And you can see that it will be enabled at the next timeout. And there are 149 seconds left. So this is a useful feature, but it's useless if you don't remove the device that caused the interface to enter the air disabled state. So that will always be step one. Disconnect the unauthorized device and then either manually re-enable the interface or let air disable recovery do it for you automatically. What will happen if you don't disconnect the unauthorized device? Well, if you manually configured the secure MAC address, the interface will simply become disabled again when it receives another frame from the unauthorized device. But if you let the switch dynamically learn the previous secure MAC address, 
it is cleared when the interface is disabled. When the interface is re-enabled, the unauthorized device's MAC address might become the new secure MAC address on the interface, which is obviously not a good situation. So, remember to disconnect the unauthorized device. Okay, now let's talk about those violation modes. I just showed you the default mode, shutdown, and how to re-enable an interface shut down by port security. But there are three different violation modes that determine what the switch will do if an unauthorized frame enters an interface configured with port security. The first is the default, shutdown. It effectively shuts down the port by placing it in an air-disabled state if an unauthorized frame enters the port. It will also generate a syslog and or SNMP message to let you know that port security disabled the interface. However, after the interface is down, it won't continue generating messages, even if the unauthorized device continues trying to send traffic. Only one message is generated to say that the port was disabled. The violation counter is set to 1 when the interface is disabled, although it will be reset to 0 when the interface is re-enabled, as you saw before. Okay, the next violation mode is restrict. The switch will discard traffic from unauthorized MAC addresses. However, the interface is not disabled. Devices with authorized MAC addresses will still be able to use the interface. The switch generates a syslog and or SNMP message each time an unauthorized MAC address is detected. And the violation counter is incremented by 1 for each unauthorized frame. Okay, that's restrict mode. Now the last one, protect mode. Like restrict mode, the switch discards traffic from unauthorized MAC addresses, and the interface is not disabled. However, it does not generate syslog or SNMP messages for unauthorized traffic. And it doesn't increment the violation counter either. It just silently discards unauthorized traffic. Okay, so we already saw the shutdown mode. Let's look at the other two. Here's the restrict violation mode. I'm starting from a fresh port security configuration, so first I enable port security. This time I manually authorized PC1's MAC address with switch port port security MAC address followed by PC1's MAC address. And here's how to enable restrict mode. Switch port port security violation restrict. Then I tried to ping R1 from PC2 and I got a bunch of syslog messages like this, which tells us that a security violation occurred caused by PC2's MAC address on the G01 interface. Let's check Show Port Security Interface. First, notice the violation mode of Restrict. And you can see that the violation count has gone to 12 because I tried to send traffic from PC2. However, the port status is Secure Up, not Secure Shutdown. So if I were to connect the cable back to PC1, it would still be able to send traffic, no problem, because the interface is still up and PC1's MAC address is authorized. Okay, that's the restrict violation mode. And here's the last one, protect. We're starting with a fresh configuration again for this example, so make sure to enable port security. I once again manually authorized PC1's MAC address, and then I configured switch port port security violation protect, and then sent some traffic from PC2. PC2's pings failed, but there were no syslog messages on switch 1. Let's check this command again. The port status is secure up, the violation mode is protect, and the violation counter is zero. So switch 1 discarded the traffic from PC2, but didn't display any syslog messages or increment the violation count. That's the protect violation mode. Okay, here's that summary of the violation modes again. These are how you control what the switch does when a port security violation occurs. You should definitely learn the actions taken by each violation mode, and remember that shutdown is the default mode. Okay, moving down to the next part of the show port security interface command. Let's check out secure MAC address aging. By the way, MAC addresses dynamically learned or statically configured on a port security enabled port are called secure MAC addresses. By default, secure MAC addresses will not age out. There is no timer. They are permanent unless you manually delete the learned MAC address or the port is disabled and then re-enabled. That's what the aging time of zero minutes means. 
However, you can configure this timer with the command switch port port security aging time, and then the time in minutes. If you do configure an aging time, the default aging type is absolute. Let me explain what that means. Absolute aging means that after the secure MAC address is learned, the aging timer starts and the MAC address is removed after the timer expires, even if the switch continues receiving frames from that source MAC address while it is counting down. However, after the MAC address ages out, it can then immediately be relearned if another frame with that source MAC address is received. The other aging type is inactivity. This is like regular MAC address aging. After the MAC address is learned, the aging timer starts, but it is reset every time a frame from that source MAC address is received. So, if the switch keeps receiving frames from that MAC address, it will never be aged out. You can configure the aging type with switch port port security aging type and then absolute or inactivity. Now, by default, only dynamically learned secure MAC addresses will age out. If you configure a MAC with switch port port security MAC address, which I showed you earlier, it won't age out. The command will remain in the running config and the MAC will remain in the MAC address table. But with the command switch port port security aging static, you can make the switch age out static secure MAC addresses too. The command will be removed from the running config, and the address will be removed from the MAC address table if it ages out. Let me show you those commands in the CLI. I configured an aging time of 30 minutes, aging type of inactivity, and enabled aging of static secure MAC addresses. Then I checked show port security interface G01 again, and you can see the output has changed now aging time 30 minutes, aging type inactivity, and secure static address aging enabled. Okay, that's all you really need to know about the timers. But before moving on to the next topic, let me show you one more useful command. Show port security. It displays which interfaces have port security enabled, the max and current number of secure addresses on those interfaces, their security violation count, and their security action. In this case, I only have port security enabled on one port, but if you have it enabled on many, this is a useful command to get an overview of your port security enabled interfaces. Next, here's the last major topic of the video, sticky secure MAC addresses. Sticky secure MAC address learning can be enabled with the following command, switch port port security MAC address sticky. When enabled, dynamically learned secure MAC addresses will be added to the running config like this. So if you look in the running config, you'll see a command like this automatically added, switch port port security MAC address sticky, and then the learned MAC address. These sticky secure MAC addresses will never age out, even if you enable static secure MAC address aging. However, because they are added to the running config, not the startup config, you'll need to save the running config to the startup config to make them truly permanent, for example with the write memory command. If you don't do that, they will be lost if the switch restarts or is turned off and then on again. When you issue the switch port port security MAC address sticky command, all current dynamically learned secure MAC addresses will be converted to sticky secure MAC addresses, so they will be added to the running config. The opposite is true too. If you remove sticky learning, Sticky secure MAC addresses will be converted to regular dynamic secure MAC addresses. Okay, let's check it out in the CLI. So, as always, I enabled port security first. Then I issued switch port port security MAC address sticky and sent a ping from PC1 to R1. I then checked the G01 interface in the running config. And as you can see, an extra command was added. Switch port port security MAC address sticky and then PC1's MAC address. I didn't configure that command. It was added automatically when PC1's frame entered the interface. So, sticky MAC addresses are basically a way of configuring static secure MAC addresses without actually having to manually configure them. Okay, before moving on to review and the quiz, let me briefly mention the MAC address table. Secure MAC addresses will be added to the MAC address table like any other MAC address. Sticky and static secure MAC addresses will have a type of static, and regular dynamically learned secure MAC addresses that aren't sticky 
will have a type of dynamic. And you can view all secure MAC addresses in the table with show MAC address table secure. I used the command and here is PC1's MAC address from the previous sticky MAC address example. Notice the type of static, even though I didn't actually statically configure it myself. It was dynamically learned. Here's a summary of the commands we covered in this video. Lots of new commands. You'll definitely want to experiment with these commands in the lab. Follow my packet tracer lab and also try making your own. If you don't remember any of these commands, go back in the video to review. Before moving on to the quiz, let's review what we learned. First, I gave an intro to port security and explained its basic function. Basically, it allows you to control what source MAC addresses and how many source MAC addresses are allowed to enter a switch interface. I also briefly explained why we should use port security. First of all, it allows us to prevent unauthorized devices from accessing the network. And secondly, it helps defend against attacks such as the DHCP exhaustion attack I showed in a previous video, in which thousands of spoofed MAC addresses are used to send DHCP discover messages. Then, while explaining various aspects of port security, I also showed you how to configure it. Make sure to watch until the end of the quiz for a bonus question from Boson Software's XSIM, my recommended practice exams for the CCNA. Okay, let's go to quiz question one. Examine the show command output below. How many secure MAC addresses were dynamically learned on the interface? Pause the video now to examine the output and select the best answer. Okay, the answer is C, three. So according to the output, four total MAC addresses have been learned on the interface. One was configured, that's not dynamic. There are three sticky MAC addresses, what about them? Although sticky MAC addresses are inserted into the running config like a static MAC address, and their type in the MAC address table is static, they are actually dynamically learned. So those three sticky MAC addresses were dynamically learned, and the answer is C. Three. Let's go to question two. Which of the following occur when a port security violation occurs in restrict mode? Select the two best answers. Okay, pause the video now to select the best answers. Okay, the best answers are B, unauthorized traffic is discarded, and E, the violation counter is incremented. In addition, a syslog message and SNMP trap will be sent. However, an SNMP get message, as in D, will not be sent. Get messages are sent from the SNMP manager to the agent, not the agent to the manager. Okay, let's go to question three. Examine the following output. What will switch one do when an unauthorized frame arrives on G01? Pause the video now to examine the output and select the best answer. Okay, the best answer is A. Unauthorized traffic will be dropped. The violation mode is protect, which means that all unauthorized frames will be dropped. However, the interface won't be air disabled. Authorized frames will still be forwarded. No syslog or SNMP messages will be sent, and the violation count won't be incremented either. Okay, let's go to question four. Which of the following will re-enable an interface that was disabled by port security? Select the two best answers. Okay, pause the video now to select the two best answers. The best answers are A, shutdown and no shutdown on the interface, and B, air disable recovery cause, P secure violation in global config mode. Either of these will work to re-enable the interface. C, unplugging the unauthorized device is incorrect because that alone will not re-enable the interface. Note that you should unplug the unauthorized device before the steps in A or B, but disconnecting the device itself won't re-enable the interface. Okay, let's go to question five. Examine the following output. What will happen when the switch port port security command is issued on G01? Pause the video now to examine the output and select the correct answer. Okay, the answer is A. The command will be accepted. 
The administrative mode of G01 is static access, so port security can be enabled. However, if it was the default administrative mode of dynamic auto, the command would be rejected. Port security can be configured on access ports or trunk ports, but they must be statically configured with switch port mode access or switch port mode trunk. Okay, that's all for the quiz. Now let's take a look at a bonus question in Boson Software's XSIM for CCNA. Okay, here's today's Boson XSIM practice question. You administer the network shown in the exhibit. You issue the following commands on switch A. Okay, so on the Fast Ethernet 01 interface, you issue switch port port security, switch port port security violation protect. Which of the following statements are true regarding this configuration? Select two choices. Okay, pause the video now to look at the choices and select the two correct choices. Okay, let's check. So, A, static MAC addresses cannot be configured on the interface. That is not true. As I showed in this video, you can configure static secure MAC addresses when port security is enabled. How about B, the interface will remain up but will drop all packets generated by the hosts connected to the hub. Okay, so the uh, protect violation mode does cause the switch to drop unauthorized packets, but one of these hosts should be authorized, should be allowed. Um, so this is not correct. It will not drop all packets. C, the interface will dynamically learn a MAC address. That means one MAC address. Uh, yes, that is correct. Uh, switch port, port security, is enabled with the default settings, so that should allow one MAC address. So I think C is correct. D, any previously learned MAC addresses will be removed. I didn't mention this in the lecture video, and this is not true. It won't remove previously learned MAC addresses. How about E? One of the hosts will not be able to access the network. I think that is correct, because once again, with the default settings, one MAC address will be allowed. So for example, this PC will be authorized by switch A, but if this PC tries to access the network, its packets, its frames will be dropped. Okay, click on show answer, and that is correct. So here is Boson's explanation. You can pause the video now to read it, and I will scroll down for the rest. And there is also a reference to some Cisco documentation about configuring port security. Okay, so that was a quick look at Boson Software's XSIM for CCNA. Once again, these are my favorite, my recommended practice exams for the CCNA, and I highly recommend them. If you want to get Boson XSIM, please follow the link in the video description. There are supplementary materials for this video. There is a flashcard deck to use with the software Anki. There will also be a packet tracer practice lab, so you can get hands-on practice. That will be in the next video. Before finishing today's video, I want to thank my JCNP level channel members. To join, please click the join button under the video. Thank you to Samil, Simode, Scott, Martin, Kwa, Christopher, Tebogo, Anand, Pavel, Abraham, Sergey, Unjoku, Victor, Roger, Suki, Kenneth, Seamus, Brandon, Marcel, Kony, Donald, Gustavo, Prakash, Nasir, Erlison, Marco, Daming, Ed, John, Funny Dart, Velva Jacob, Yusuf, Boson Software, Devin, Jonathan, and Vance. Sorry if I pronounced your name incorrectly, but thank you so much for your support. This is the list of JCNP level members at the time of recording, by the way. May 26th, 2021. If you signed up recently and your name isn't on here, don't worry. You'll be in future videos. Thank you for watching. Please subscribe to the channel, like the video, leave a comment, and share the video with anyone else studying for the CCNA. If you want to leave a tip, check the links in the description. I'm also a Brave verified publisher and accept BAT or basic attention token tips via the Brave browser. That's all for now.